This is what my monitor looked like two weeks ago. It wouldn't turn on. Well, that LED power light would come on, but the screen sure wouldn't. This is what that monitor looks like today. Apparently these little black capacitors can age and go out of service, as evidenced by their bulging caps. Those are supposed to be flat. So after eight years of faithful service from my trusty old monitor, I decided its death was a great excuse to make an upgrade. It was time to finally enter the 20th century and enjoy some 1080p. But in the upper mid-range pricing tiers of monitors these days, you can make a choice between two luxury features that haven't really either become standard yet. The higher than 1080p resolutions that steer into 4K territory, or the higher than 60Hz refresh rates that steer into 144fps territory. Most low-response gaming-oriented monitors in the upper 200s that I saw had either one feature or the other, but not both, and I opted for the higher frame rates. Like a lot of you, I grew up believing a lie. I was told, and I think this came from some old official PlayStation magazine, that 60 frames per second is the highest frame rate human eyes can see. I don't know why this became accepted as common knowledge the way I remember it was, but it was probably because the standards we've gotten ourselves used to were put in place for reasons of practicality rather than aesthetics. Traditional animation is usually 12 frames per second because drawing each and every frame was a hell of a lot of hard work. Movies were traditionally 24 frames per second for a lot of reasons, and one is that if it was higher it would make for a hell of a long film reel. And the gold standard for games is traditionally 60 frames per second because unlike the other mediums, they demand precision input from its audience. That is, unless they're compromising on frame rate for fidelity and coming up with more marketable words than compromise to explain it. Anyways, for twitchy action genres, higher frame rates make for a more responsive game, which is why for the longest time a lot of competitive players swore by old CRT monitors, which until very recently actually offered the highest refresh rates and lowest response time of them all. But over the past few years, people are finally coming to grow out of that misconception that 60 frames per second is the highest we can and ever will see, which is almost a nonsensical statement. After all, your eyes don't transmit still images to your brain one frame at a time, like computer hardware does. In fact, the amount of quick, speedy motions a person can see changes depending on their lifestyle, profession, and training. Some studies have shown people able to identify specific images flashed for as little as 13 milliseconds, and others have shown people able to react to flashes of color in as little as less than 10 milliseconds. Although at that level, subjects weren't able to accurately report what they had been shown. Both of those numbers are lower than the 16.6 .6 millisecond frame duration of 60 frames per second. But maybe a more useful question would be, would a frame rate higher than 60 really make that much of a difference? Yes, look at how much smoother it is. Can't you tell? Actually, you can't tell how much smoother it is. At least not on YouTube videos, which are currently restricted to a 30 frames per second cap. So I can't really show you what 144 FPS looks like on my screen, and my capture software can only record a max of 120. But what I can do is slow down that 120 frames per second footage to a 30 frames per second equivalent. And I'm gonna zoom in here for emphasis. Note how the wall textures on the right are scrolling smoother than they are on the left. That's because the source footage on the right has more frames to display when slowed down to the same speed as the footage on the left. You still get some mixed results though. Turning your refresh rate on to 120Hz doesn't automatically mean everything is going to move at 120 frames per second. Reload animations still have the same amount of frames in them, but the difference in camera movement is night and day. Just try to imagine both of these pieces of footage sped up to four times their current speed to visualize how much smoother camera movement is at 120 frames per second. And that's also the reason why I went with a 144Hz monitor over a 4 monitor. Not for how much smoother it'll make games look, but how smoother it'll make them feel. Since your monitor is displaying extra frames, you have extra frames to play with. The visual difference is subtle. There's a lot of diminishing returns on the prettiness of your picture at 144 FPS, but there aren't as many for game feel. And that's really hard to explain, but let me put it this way. You have 84 more frames in each second to aim with, react with, and visually process data with. In practice, it feels like I have more time 
time to aim up tricky shots, despite not actually having more time to aim tricky shots. Within fractions of a second, you can make minute alterations to your aim that you couldn't before, and it is the most unfair thing in the world. Sure enough, within day one of having this monitor, I felt like my accuracy and headshot ratio in Counter-Strike increased significantly. So I decided to put my money where my mouth is and test myself. I recorded my accuracy and my kill-death ratio for four 10-minute rounds of Counter-Strike Go against expert-level bots using only the AK. I switched the monitor's refresh rate to 144, 100, and finally 60 hertz to measure the difference in my performance with each mode, and average the last three rounds together, because the first one would count as the warm-up. And the results really surprised me. As this fancy Microsoft Word chart shows, my KD ratio did slightly increase with frame rate, but my accuracy did not. While it was highest at 144 FPS, it was also higher at 60 FPS than 100 FPS, which was very unexpected. My method wasn't exactly exhaustive science. For this to be credible, believable data, it would require a lot more people and a much tighter control, but for my purposes, it could suggest any number of things. Maybe as I was playing, I learned to predict the bot routes better, or or maybe one's performance is not as dependent on frame rate as I thought. Or maybe a lifetime of experience at that particular frame rate of 60 was enough to give me the edge over higher frame rates despite the handicap it presented. What these numbers suggest is that going higher than 60 FPS is not a guaranteed competitive edge. At least, not until you're going significantly higher than 60 FPS. For most of us, that's not necessary, and not game-breaking. For most of us, frame rates that high are simply a luxury, and for most of the gaming industry, it is almost an afterthought. That's what my experience trying to find compatible games has suggested. Counter-Strike Global Offensive was the most flexible and useful game to play at 144 frames per second, and thank god for that. So was Nitronic Rush, believe it or not. The super high frame rate there didn't just look dazzling, but also really helped me nail some of the trickier moves. Quake Live has a default frame rate cap of 125 until you open up the console and change it. Payday 2 has a 135 FPS cap. Bioshock 1 ran at 144 FPS without any extra tinkering, but it caps its physics animations at 30 FPS, which looked weird at 60 FPS, but even weirder at 144 FPS. Dark Souls 2 was capped at 60, and so were a few Japanese shmups and fighting games, and those actually didn't surprise me one bit. Frame rate caps are somewhat of a controversial topic, and to understand why, you kind of have to visualize how game logic works with relation to time. If a game is intended to run locked at 60 frames per second all the time, then the game's very mechanics and logic can be programmed to interpret the flow of time in terms of frames rather than milliseconds, which is why you see lower FPS caps on console ports rather than games built for PCs where the player's frame rate is less predictable. It's uh, not exactly a noble excuse for why frame rate caps exist, but that is one reason they do. For example, the very delicate, very deliberate frame-by-frame -frame balance of 2D fighting games is why you'll probably never see them go beyond 60 FPS. Perhaps the two most recent memorable examples of seeing frame rate based game logic in action are Need for Speed Rivals, which, when played at 60 FPS, literally doubled the speed of your cars from the intended 30 FPS, and Titanfall, where your gun's rate of fire would increase with your frame rate, at least before they patched that problem out. If you're playing Dark Souls 1 at 60 FPS, you have to be careful not to click through menu prompts fast or you risk getting stuck in them. The QTEs in the new 60 FPS version of Resident Evil 4 are strangely easier or harder than intended because that's not its originally intended frame rate, and it's the same deal with Metal Gear Rising if you try to go lower or higher than 60 FPS with that one. So as long as console games are the dominant sales force in this industry, a lot of higher end games are going to be built to their specifications, even down to the mechanical level, and I don't actually have as much of a problem with that as some folks, but I'm afraid that after buying this monitor, I might. I guess it's just unfortunate that my favorite games these days happen to be console ports that have that 60 FPS cap. See, that's yet another problem with acclimating myself to uncommonly high frame rates, and that is a problem of raising my standards. If you consider that a problem, that is. Ignorance is bliss, after all, and I fear that as I get used to 144 frames per second, then anything lower is just going to look worse than what might be reasonable, given the current pricing tiers of hardware. So maintaining whatever I'll soon begin to consider an acceptable frame rate is only going to make my gaming habits more expensive.
I suppose it should already clue me in that the only games I can actually get to run at 144 frames per second are a couple years old, and weren't performance hogs to begin with. So right now, it only makes sense for me to actually attempt to max that frame rate out for twitchy action multiplayer games, where the extra precision of that high frame rate is more important and more useful than the smoother moving picture on the screen. Until then, it's going to take a lot of industry effort to turn those high frame rates into a more standardized feature. The industry would need to be pushing to make those displays more affordable, to make PC games more optimized, to stop tying game logic to frame rates, and to push for higher frame rates on consoles, and the reality is that that's going to seem like overkill in 99% of all cases. But if you're a competitive first-person shooter player, that's a case where you're going to want to get one of these monitors ASAP. But if you're competitive about fighting games, it's really not going to make a difference at all and may never. If you're competitive about RTS or MOBAs, I can't really comment since that's not really my scene, but I can say that among all the differences I noticed, the most dramatic was with the Windows shell itself. For real, it's incredible. Clicking and dragging around Windows all of a sudden looks really good. Anyways, in my admittedly brief experience, only a few games really justified the cost of going above and beyond the 60 FPS standard. For me, those games were Counter-Strike and Quake Live. If those don't exactly sound like your cup of tea, then these frame rates are truly a vanity feature. They're nice when you can get them, but they're not exactly a truly marketable, practical step forward for the industry at large.